Hello, everyone. This is Leah Freeberg from Fluke Reliability, and thanks for joining us today for this best practices webinar. You all probably know Fluke as a test tools provider, and you may also know that we produce some of the industry's favorite reliability tools from infrared cameras to vibration meters. But you may not know that many of the measurements that our tools collect now flow automatically into a variety of EAM systems of record. It happens by a framework that we call Fluke Excelix. Our goal at Fluke Reliability is to better connect asset management data and teams with asset management systems to drive connected knowledge. And of course, that knowledge depends greatly on best practices in condition-based maintenance. So that's why this series of webinars explores reliability maintenance strategies, and that's why we feature speakers from a variety of expert backgrounds. Before today's presentation, we have a few housekeeping items to go over. This session is being recorded, so your phone lines will be muted to minimize background noise. We'll be answering questions during the session and afterward at Q&A. So take a minute now and find the questions tool in your GoToWebinar dashboard. Fe please feel free to submit questions as we go, and I will share as many of them as time allows for our presenters to answer. And if we have unanswered questions at the end, we'll follow up with written answers. If you'd like to receive the slides from today's presentation, please let us know. There'll be a survey that appears at the end of today's session. So don't hang up until the survey appears and you've answered the questions because that will trigger getting the slides. We're also happy to send you a certificate of attendance after today's webinar. You'll see a question on the survey about getting a certificate. So answer yes to that one and we'll send the certificate to you. A recording of this webinar will be available on the Excelix.com website within a day or two. And that's it for housekeeping. Now for the main event. Today we are very pleased to have with us Samantha Lassane and John Burnett, condition monitoring experts from Fluke Reliability. They'll be presenting on vibration monitoring for peak asset performance. Let me introduce John. As a mechanical application and product specialist with Fluke Reliability, John Burnett works with customers from all industries, successfully or helps customers from all industries successfully implement their reliability programs. He has more than 30 years of experience in the maintenance and operation of commercial machinery and as a nuclear power plant electrician in the US Navy. He holds a category two vibration analyst certification and is a certified maintenance reliability professional CMRP. Welcome, John. Thank you very much for being with us today. Oh, hey, thanks, Leigh. I'm uh, fighting with trying to unmute myself. Okay, well, let's uh, let's uh, let's get started here. And uh, oh, I've got to figure out if I can find a way to move the slides too. So um, thanks for the introduction. So let me get rolling here as soon as I can get this slide to advance. Sorry about that. These things happen. Yep. All right. So what are we going to talk about today? So we're going to start off by talking a little bit about vibration monitoring. We're going to talk about what you can find from uh, vibration monitoring. What are the benefits? A little bit about machines uh, that are best for vibration monitoring and then some tools for vibration monitoring. Okay, so what is vibration monitoring? Now, one thing I always like to preface uh, when I talk to customers is that vibration can be used for a lot of different things and and sorry my uh my audio was lost but i think i'm back now all right so um vibration can be used for uh you know there's seismic mo monitoring there's uh, uh vibration monitoring to look for quality there's vibration monitoring to reduce uh, big vibrations but we're going to be using it to uh, for condition-based maintenance of machines, so that we. So when I was in the the Navy, uh, you know, I was on uh, aircraft carrier Nimitz, and we used it to uh, monitor the condition of about 500 uh, pieces of rotating machinery, and uh, that way we would know when a machine uh, had a problem and when we needed to take it down and fix it. So that's 
that's the purpose of vibration monitoring in our context. So let's talk a little bit about what is vibration monitoring. And we're not gonna get into the deep details of the spectral graphs over on the right, but every rotating machine has a vibration signature or uh, you know vibration spectrum. Um, and what we're looking at is we're looking at these vibration spectrum uh, and we, the raw data that we're gonna collect is something called a time waveform. Now the time waveform is, think of a machine as, as, as dynamic. It's almost like a, like a body or a person in that um, it's, it's always changing. And um, you know, when you look at the vibration, it isn't just the machine, but we're gonna get vibration from the background. We're gonna get vibration from the process, from the structure. From, uh, from turbulences. And so uh, think of it almost like an EKG of a person uh, and there's a lot of jumbled up noise going on. So, so sometimes it's somewhat confusing, but the good news is over the years, we've learned that we can find patterns in the data. Just like when a doctor looks at your EKG, they're looking for a pattern. And so that's what we're looking for. And the, the complex waveform can be simplified by a process called fast Fourier transformation, which, conf which converts that very complicated time waveform to a more simplified thing that we can analyze. And so that's what a spectrum is, and that's what a vibration data is gonna look, look like, is it's gonna be a simplified plot of amplitude versus frequency. Okay, so again, that's just kind of an introduction of what is vibration and what do we use it for. Now, how can we use it to look for faults in rotating machinery? Well, what we've learned over the years is that there are really four main faults for rotating machinery. We call these the big, the big four. And uh, over the years, when I've been analyzing data, I can tell you that I saw these big four each and every time, every day. Um, the other faults, there are thousands of other faults, but we just don't see them that often. And so that's why we're gonna really focus on, on these main four. So they are imbalance, misalignment, looseness, and bearing. So, what is imbalance? Imbalance, just like it shows here in the picture, is where you have a heavy spot on the shaft and every time it rotates around, you're gonna feel that high vibration. And so imbalance is in all radial directions, up and down and side to side. Um, and it's a good indication uh, that the machine is imbalanced and Imbalance and misalignment are really the two leading causes of high vibration. And unfortunately, a lot of customers, including myself, when I, we were in the Navy, uh, we would replace the bearings and seals, but often we would ignore the root cause, which was imbalance and misalignment. So that's one thing that we're gonna talk about uh, as we go through this, uh, this webinar is, we, we don't wanna ignore the root cause. And so misalignment is another root cause. Uh, misalignment, there's been studies that have shown misalignment can be as high as 50% of the faults of rotating machinery. And when I was in the Navy, we did the same thing that a lot of people do is we ignored misalignment. Why? Because we figured that if we just slapped the two pieces together and bolted it up that, that and eyeballed it, it was good enough. But it uh, even a little bit of misalignment that's left in a machine or imbalance will lead to additional load that'll cause the bearings to wear there. So misalignment is where your two shafts aren't aligned to each other. And even though a lot of people feel that couplings are designed to take up for the misalignment, that's a little bit of a falsehood in that, yes, they do adjust and that does protect the coupling, but it simply transfers load to the bearings and the seals. So 
that's why misalignment isn't something that we can just ignore and and have the coupling take over. So the little tip that uh, that we have down here at the bottom is that even though vibration analysis is looking at data that can somewhat be complex, it really can be simplified to three steps. One is we identify the peaks inside the data to their source of the machine. For example, is that vibration coming from the rotating shaft? Second, we look for patterns in the data. What are the patterns? Well, what we're looking at right here, imbalance is going to be seen at the once per revolution of the rotating shaft as that heavy spot comes around and it's gonna be seen in the radial direction. So that's the pattern that we look for. And then finally, uh, we, we, we look at the amplitude of the peaks and the increase in that pattern to determine how bad the fault is. So even though I've, I've made it sound pretty straightforward and pretty simple, um, but the good news is we can follow those rules uh, as we analyze machines. Okay, let's do, um, one more slide here to finish this up. Um, so looseness and bearing damage. These are the other two of what we call the big four. Looseness can be either rotating looseness or non-rotating looseness. You can have loose bearings. You could have a loose structure. You could have a loose component inside your machine. Looseness is going to show up and it's going to cause, again, increased vibration, but it's going to be in a different pattern. It's going to be at the, the harmonics or the echoes of shaft rotation. And then finally, bearing damage. Bearing damage uh, is one that we're all familiar with, um, and most bearings are designed to last for years and years, and there's a lot of factors that can wear on the, on the, the bearings lubrication, temperature, uh, load, but so also can be uh, some forces for misalignment, imbalance, and looseness. So we want to look at some of these faults, and we want to watch the bearing pattern as it degrades over time. So down at the bottom is a good tip. We talked a little bit about the big four, but I mentioned earlier there are a lot I mean, there are a lot of other faults, literally thousands of faults that we can diagnose, but these things don't show up that often. So it's, uh, it's something that we often will look for the big faults first because we see them every day and we're not going to identify all, we're not going to look, look for all of these thousands of faults because we just don't see them uh, that often. It's like when you go see the, the general practice doctor the doctor's not going to do a full workup and look at all the different problems that could be wrong with you. They're going to look for the most common problems first before they get to these really uh, rare and, and maybe uh, hard to find faults. Okay, let's uh, jump over to a poll question. So let me turn this over to Leah so that she can do a poll question and then she'll introduce Samantha after that. Sounds good, John, and thank you. So audience, you know what to do here. If you cannot click the buttons, then reduce your screen size. If you have the poll at max screen, it may not activate. So your question is, which of these measurements do you use to assess machine health at your facility? Are you using thermal, thermography, infrared, vibration of any sort, oil analysis, ultrasound or other, where other obviously includes electrical, motor tests, um, et cetera. So you get to select as many as apply here because we assume that you are approaching your fault analysis from a variety of perspectives. These all show you different things. I'd like to get about 75% of the audience to vote. I'm gonna give you another 10 or 15 seconds here so that we can give you time to select as many of these measurement types as are applicable for your facility. So select as many of these as apply, thermal or infrared, vibration, oil analysis, ultrasound, or other. 
I'm gonna give it about five more seconds and then I'm gonna share the results with everyone. And uh, there we go. Okay, so John and Samantha, we have 75% of the audience using thermal and infrared, go audience. 78% are using vibration, best audience ever. 63% are using oil analysis, well done. 33% are using ultrasound and 16% are using some other measurement types as well. So John, I'm pretty impressed. What do you think about this? John, are you there? Uh, sorry, here I am. It just took me a minute to get off of uh, mute. So uh, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm impressed as well. Those numbers are very, very good because uh, um, it shows that uh, not only is it a good mix of those technologies, it's also showing that uh, you know that uh, the cust that uh, the users are uh, are are following those, and those are those are great technologies. And so it's it's good to see people are using them. So yeah, that's good. It is. And audience, I want to remind you to use the questions tool in GoToWebinar to submit your questions as we go, um, because we will slide them in at a couple of different points during the presentation. Um, John, we have a couple of good starter questions, if I may. The first sure. one I want to ask you is, where do we get the limits, the appropriate limits of vibration for the machines in our facility? That's a that's a, that's a good question. So there's 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 two answers to that. Um, um, and so the limits for machines um, really are only applicable to um, overall vibration levels. So if you think about that, uh, it's it's like um, and and it isn't it, it's hard to to well it's impossible to find limits on uh the fft or the or the raw vibration signatures because there is so much variation from machine to machine so if you think about it uh let's go back to the analogy of the medical industry an ekg there's no way to make limits on an ekg because you're looking at complex data with a lot of different frequencies a lot of different peaks and a lot of interaction and and where with a when you look at pulse or or blood pressure that is something we can have a limit on because it's just a simple number so the 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 short answer is we really can't have limits on complex waveform um but we can learn what is good and what is bad by doing pattern recognition so instead of a numerical limit like we would do for overall vibration. So for screening, you know, is a machine good or bad? We can take an overall vibration, which basically is like taking a pulse or a blood pressure. It doesn't give us quite as much information, but it's a good indicator of what's going on with this machine. And, and um, you know, so that we can have limits on. So there are many different ISO standards and a lot of different industry limits that are that come from overall vibration levels. All right, so I think I took that one, probably beat it to death. Uh. <laughs> you know what, you actually answered several questions in the process, so well done, because we have some questions coming in about ISO and other standards. <laughs> um, and I don't know if you plan to address this, but uh, there's also questions about those related measurement types. For example, where do we get bearing temperature limits? Do you want to address that now or save that for later? Yeah, why don't we wait till we get kind of a little closer towards the end because we are going to talk about other things. And uh, if we haven't answered that, maybe we can pick that up as we get towards uh, towards the end. Okay, the other thing I'm going to plant as a seed question is we have some interest in the ROI for machine health and using analytics. So maybe as you get further in your presentation, you can address that as well. Got it, got it. Okay, okay. thanks. So for now, I'm going to introduce our second speaker, Samantha Lassane. 
a product manager for Fluke Reliability, Samantha manages the development and delivery of hardware and software solutions, collaborating with the combined engineering strength of Fluke and Proof Technic to bring products to market. Her background includes technical application and business experience with reliability maintenance challenges and solutions. She has a master's degree from Pace University in New York and is currently focused on sensors and condition monitoring technology and applications. Welcome, Samantha. Thank you so much for being with us today. Hello. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm going to turn it over to you now. Oh, okay. Um, and, and John, I think you're still my slide mover yes. pusher. What shall we say? Uh, if you can go to the next slide. To kind of pick up from where where John left off, um, you know, he talked about what can be determined and the different faults that we have. Um, what we commonly hear are what are the benefits of vibration monitoring? Like, why is it important? It kind of gets to this this question that Leah was was asking about the ROI, and I think. Um, it becomes clear as we start to, to spell things out a little bit. So we did want to highlight some, 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 some particular things. One of the benefits of vibration monitoring is that if we had uh, the, the, the PF curve, you could look at it at, at, and see that when you get warnings and, and get um, data back from uh, your, your vibration measurements, is that you're able to understand at an earlier phase than some of the other things that we had had uh, on, on our poll question, um, that that something is coming, and you're able to make a, a change um, depending upon which fault it could potentially be. You're able to, to say, okay, well, we need to make a repair, we need to make a replacement, we need to make, take an action, but you're doing that at a very um, machine-based, condition-based uh, time frame, rather than adding in more of um, a, more of a, a reactive state. So it, in when we let's talk about predictability, which is the, the first point here, that's what we're we're talking about. Giving the staff um, a clear understanding, a clear time frame in which they can go and, and make a change or take an action, rather than always being caught on your back heel. Uh, the the other thing is 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 safety. Uh, for a lot of these, a lot of these uh, tools that we have for vibration, especially sensors, whether they be wired or wireless sensors, uh, we have the ability to kind of, we hate to say set it and forget it, but in a lot of situations, to put that sensor on at a, at a potentially a, a downtime for that machine and and step away, get that data understand what's happening without having someone be actively there uh, with that machine all the time, taking measurements uh, when, it, when there could potentially be a, a dangerous situation. For revenue, I think this is the one where the ROI comes into play a lot. <laughs> um, so it, you're really balancing um, the cost of the machine, the cost of uh, the, the labor to repair something that's broken, the cost of production that could be lost based upon uh, an unplanned downtime and, and, and looking at all of those things to roll into, is that worth the, the cost of doing this monitoring? Whether that be handheld tools or, or sensors, you really want to, to ask yourselves uh, and, and get that benefit back of, of saying, hey, by putting this X, X dollar amount tool or working with this this particular tool, yes, it costs us this much money, but in the long run over this machine, this one machine, or potentially if you're using a handheld tool, the, these many machines, we've seen this type of, of revenue um, ROI for ourselves. John, John has, I think, some, some specific case studies in, uh, in, in the next slide so that we can, we can dig more into that one in particular. Uh, and then we we also want to really hone in on the reliability factor. Um, what we're hearing from customers and what even even at Fluke as as a business, uh, our our buildings that we've talked to our our internal M um, and R team about is this 
unplanned downtime causes problems. Uh, and the problems are, are different depending upon the company. Um, for our, our fluke building, it's, it's having uh, a machine go down that has a lot of um, high in, um, inconvenience for people. Uh, and the, the situation of uh, a plant or uh, industrial facility, um, that could mean a, a lot of money and it could mean anything especially depending upon the machine. Uh, it could mean anything between a day's downtime to potentially several day, day, days downtime. Uh, I think we, we recently talked to some people that were in the food and beverage industry, for instance, and they were explaining a lot of the machines that, that they had at, at their particular facility were, um, were um, built in, uh, in Europe there was long lead times that they had to wait. And if the, their machine went down, that meant that it could be the entire month's, uh, the, the loss of the, hitting the month's numbers. Uh, they may get production out, it may be slower, but it, it wouldn't be at the, the rate that they needed to. So adding that reliability in of knowing, I'm not gonna have to worry about that. I I'm can go into my facility, deal with the, the normal maintenance tasks that I may need to, to deal with, but we're not going to see something uh, as a, a catastrophic failure come down on these particular machines is is adding that reliability to the day and it also kind of feeds into that next point which is is that peace of mind uh how do we feel comfortable going into our budget planning how do we feel comfortable uh, making choices on where what labor should be doing um if people are able to especially <laughs> Uh, I, I know we know coming up over the summer or the holidays, people are able to take holiday breaks and vacations and things like that. How comfortable are we even, or, or managers uh, even in, in saying, you know, I'm gonna clock out for the night and I'm gonna put my, my work away for the day. Uh, and, and so that, that peace of mind comes not just for uh, the maintenance manager or the reliability engineer, but everybody on the team. And then one thing that we did have in here is the tip. Um, a vibration program is only as effective uh, when it is managed. Uh, and, and what we mean by that is um, we, we have seen in the past where people go and they create a program that is either potentially too large or too demanding of resources to actually go and, and be as effective as it should be. Um, if, if there's if you're if you're doing too much or you're monitoring too much and you you can't effectively monitor you're not going to get the benefit out of the program if you're asking for your team to do more than what they can uh, then again you're not going to get a lot out of that program that's why we we adamantly suggest starting at a, 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 a small program that you can manage and then scaling up as your team gets more comfortable and as as the, the benefits of vibration monitoring come more into play. John, next slide. Okay, thanks. Um, well, let me see if I can get it to advance. Sorry about that. My computer went to sleep, so let's... Let me try a different way. There we go. So that was great, uh, Samantha. Thanks for the uh, the the talk about the uh, uh, you know vi the benefits of vibration benefits. When we start talking about the benefits of of vibration, uh, we're always asked about ROI and and cost studies and that kind of thing. And uh, I mean, uh, I, over the past thirty years, I've been doing this. I've been asked this so many so many times. Um, and we have, there are hundreds of examples and I'll go through some of these and there's tons of charts and ROIs, but it's kind of a good news, bad news in that we have plenty of examples, but customers that ask for ROI calculators to help them cost justify a program, there's a couple of obstacles in the way. And, and in, in today's world of tight competition, um, you know, we have customer privacy concerns. And so it's hard for us to get some of these real numbers uh, and competitive concerns. You know, people wanna know what are the numbers for in my industry on my type of application. But the problem is 
it's hard to get that information from the competition because they don't want to give away their competitive advantage. And so, so there are challenges. The other challenge is, you know, it's hard to actually get these numbers from your own company. So, so what can we do? So the, the, the solutions are, there's two solutions. And the first one I'm going to talk about is there are a lot of case studies that we can show you that, that discuss where the, the typical cost savings are from. So if you see this one example I have over on the left, this is a large company that over a 25 year period, um, they monitored hundreds of, of motors and pumps and fans, compressors and blowers, and they documented their saves. And that's part of the key is, you know, you know a lot of customers don't document their saves. And so it's hard for us to, to to give ROI calculators is because we just don't have the numbers and there's only a few companies that have actually written those numbers down. And so this example shows how this particular company had a, uh, uh, every two years they do a cost of benefit study and they documented and proved that their benefit to cost ratio was 20 to one, which meant that for every dollar they spent in reliability, they could document savings of over twenty dollars, and so uh, and you can see the six di different benefits they tracked over on the left hand side. Now, the other one I'm going to show you is for a smaller company, and you know, so to show you that it isn't just the big companies that save money; it's also small companies. Here's a small company that over a 16 year period, they went from run to failure maintenance to pr predictive maintenance and their unplanned failures dropped to almost zero. Their budget was decreased, was cut in half on their 600 critical motors and pumps. Their mean time between failure, which is the time between repairs, doubled on these machines. And they basically, we talk about peace of mind and scheduling that Samantha brought up. This company proved that they uh, that they they didn't they knew all about all their machines. Okay, so how we've talked about the benefits, we've talked about other customers. How do we get that related to your to your company and your personal numbers? The problems that I've mentioned before are the obstacles from companies not wanting to share that information because of security, because of company protocols, and because of uh, competition concerns. Solution that we can get that information. Well, the solution is like, like Samantha mentioned, pilot programs. You know, it all boils down to start a small pilot program because then you're not having to put out a lot of investment. You're not having to invest a lot of money and resources. You test drive it, you know, just like when you go down to, to see the car down at the dealership, let's test drive this program and prove that it works. Start small and grow, show, show some cost savings. That then allows you to be able to go out and get buy I in for management, get budget, and grow the program. Because now that you can show some cost savings, sorry, my audio lost again, give it a second. Okay, I think I'm back. So this way you can find some cost savings and then you can go use your own numbers to build your own ROI. Um, okay, so I think I think we've covered the ROI question. Uh, if, if not, we can get in a little bit more. So let me turn this over to Leah. And uh, I think that goes into our next poll question. Indeed. All right, so audience, here's your second chance. What is your biggest blocker to starting vibration monitoring at your facility? Is it, and you can only select one here, lack of leadership buy-in, you still need to convince people of the ROI and the value. Is it your team culture within that maintenance and reliability, where they prefer other types of measurement approaches? Is it a lack of resources, being time or money or people? Um, is there some other kind of blocker, or do you feel like you don't have any blockers and you're ready to go, or perhaps you're already doing it? So give us your best option here. Again, I'd like to get at least half of the audience voting so that Samantha and John have an idea of where you're at. 
for the second part of their presentation here. Select your biggest blocker to starting vibration monitoring. Is it leadership buy-in, team culture and the way you're used to doing things? Is it resources, time or money, something else or no blockers? I'm going to give it about five more seconds. I know this is maybe more of a deep thought question. I'll just give it your best answer um, for the purposes of guiding the conversation that comes next. All right. Great job, everyone. I'm going to share the results now. So we have 14% saying that they're working on leadership buy-in. 10% are talking about team culture. 33% say a lack of resources, time, or money. 4% say maybe some other blocker. And 39% say no blockers, which is fantastic. Audience, again, excellent. Really, really good. John and Samantha, any comments? Yeah, no, I, th I think this is this is really good to see the no blockers and, and to really see the to the the lack of leadership isn't the yeah. you know that the next one. Um, you know, time and resources and, and, and money. I think when I think this goes back a little bit to the the ROI question that the judge was answering. And I would say, you know, when, when you start looking at a program and, and you're using some of those best practices, thinking small, where to learn, um, creating a, a program that fits your team, um, it you you can start to find ways to kind of create a bit of an ROI for yourself. Um, uh -huh potentially before you get started that might help with this lack of resources, especially if you do have that leadership buy-in to move forward. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Yeah, and uh, we've had some audience questions right aligned with this. So I'm going to, there we go, take the poll away. I would like to slide in a couple of audience questions at this point, if that's okay. Sure. All right. Okay. Can vibration monitoring detect problems with belt-driven equipment, specifically belt misalignment of incorrect tension? Um, yes, yes. So we would take vibration measurements from the motor and the pump or the fan, and we could, you know, of course we're going to look for imbalance, misalignment, bearings, and looseness in both of those components from the shaft. But that's that uh, you know belt problems it falls into that category of the other you know so it's almost like looking you know uh, looking at a forest through all the trees we first want to eliminate the most obvious things and then what do we get left over with and so often what's left over on belt driven machine you're right are is 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 belt problems and um, it's a little bit more um i'd say advanced but still well within the realm of most vibration analysts to be able to look for belt problems because belt problems have their own unique pattern just like bearings and imbalance and misalignment so once you know what to look for it's easy enough to determine yes that is a belt because it's not imbalanced misalignment bearings and looseness it follows the pattern of the belt and over the past few months, it's been getting worse and worse. And so then you would get flagged that, hey, let's go take a look at the belts. Mm -hmm. So yes, absolutely. How about for a motor driven pump? Where, at what points would you take uh, vibration measurements using a monitoring system? That's that's a good question. So, so the answer uh, for almost all machinery is, we need to take at least one measurement on the motor and at least one measurement on the pump. And even if it's a small motor and a small pump, we need to at least take one measurement from each shaft. Why? Because even if you're only concerned about the motor or only concerned about the pump, the only way that we can analyze the source of the problem is to take a measurement from both components. So to analyze, to diagnose a problem, and the motor, we're going to compare the data taken on the motor to the pump and see where the vibration levels are highest. If it's a large motor and a large pump, we need to take data from both bearings on the motor and both bearings on the pump if possible, because 
you know, we need to know uh, whether the vibration is coming from the, the free end of the motor or the drive end. Uh, the good news is on a small motor pump, we can get it from either bearing, but on a large motor, vibration only transmits about 30, 36 inches down a shaft. And so if you've got a large motor, we need to take it from both bearings or it's not going to make it from one bearing to the other. So, so I, I kind of went long on that answer, but the, the answer is, uh, the, the, the answer is it depends. It depends on the size of the motor pump. It depends on, on how it's set up, but the short answer is at least one from the motor, at least one from the pump. Excellent. I'm going to turn it back over to you guys now. Okay. Uh, next slide, John. All right. Yep. Let me see how long it takes for my uh, computer to wake up here. So there we go. Over to you. Okay, great. So I did see this question in in the the chat as well. Uh, so what mo machines are best monitored with uh, vibration monitoring? Um, for, for the most part, we, we would say um, you know, rotating assets or rotating machinery. We've got a, a couple of of ex of examples here, um, and what I would say is that when you're when you're looking at these, you know, if if we kind of refer down to the the, the tip that's down there. Um, is that the impact on your facility is is your impact, right? Um, you know, we, we can say that you know we, we see most vibration monitorings on on generally motors and pumps. <laughs> uh, John John will say motors and pumps and pumps and pumps. Uh, <laughs> um, but uh, that that's because it's it's one of you know the, the more common categories. But if you've got an electric motor, or sorry, if you've got a compressor or a blower or a fan, and, and that's the most important thing in your facility for whichever reason, um, generally because if that goes down, either A, lots of people are inconvenienced, or B, your your company is losing a lot of money, then then that's kind of where you want to spend. Um, a, a lot of your, your time with your vibration monitoring. Uh, we'll, we'll get more into asset criticality in a couple of slides, but the important thing is that you, you do take the time to understand which assets are the, the most important for your, your facility to run. And I use that term kind of open for whatever, whatever way run means to you. Um, and that you're able to really look at it and say, okay, what um, what out of this machine do I need to get, and what what type of of monitoring is best from that machine? We've had um, questions about machines that don't fall into this category, and and um, we would say, you know, honestly, that's probably vibration may, may not be the best for that type of machine. Um, we've had machines where we're like, no, absolutely, yes, let's let's go forward and, and look at if you're looking at, especially. One thing that's not on here that we we see a lot as well again in the food and bev industry is a is a conveyor now they've got lots of parts that that will fall into this line but um for for a lot of facilities that goes down um and and they're 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 stopping their work so we say generally rotating assets and then um you know really looking to see what 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 is important for your your facility uh, next slide. To kind of carry over, we do have a, a slide of of what tools. Hey, John, um, there we go. <laughs> Success. Uh, what what tools can be considered uh, for our, our best for for you? Um, there's a list of questions. Um, you know, uh, there we we with Fluke, I think everybody knows, is we have, you know, we have, especially in uh, Fluke reliability, um, general vibration tools, handheld tools. We have um, sensors, both wired and wireless, and it's important to figure out what is the best tool for for the machine that you're looking at, right? Um, you know, some I, some people have asked, like, can we have one tool to do a catch-all? Um, 
the, the chances of one tool actually working for for everything is is, is very rare um, <clears throat> especially when you want to focus on a particular a particular type of machine or in a particular area so let's look at these questions that we have here so uh, which of my machines would be best served with a handheld tool or with a wired or wireless uh, vibration sensor. Um, this is kind of the highest level. This is where you would want to start your questionnaire and then um, a questionnaire in your brain uh, and then and then work your way down. But it does set the tone of saying, you know, do I have um, a, a labor shortage issue and such that I, I won't have the time or my team won't have the time to go around and do route based with handheld? Um, do I have a situation where maybe um, uh, we don't have, speaking of those lack of resources, we don't have the resources at this time to have individual tools for every machine. Um, maybe it's it's splitting it up and saying, hey, for these special machines, I may need a, a, a sensor because these are my super critical machines. And for others, I, I can get by with a handheld tool. Once you start to, to figure that top layer question out, these rest, the rest of these questions will will help guide you to get you to an area that, that you can focus in on. So does my supercritical machine warrant continuous monitoring uh, and, and sophisticated data? Here's a situation where uh, you, you may want to have a, a wireless sensor, you may want to have a wired sensor. Um, if you've got a situation where you're saying, I need data and I need lots of it, <laughs> And in order to understand um, what, what I need to understand, I need to be able to analyze that data and I need to be able to get the, the right information out. That may be a wired sensor for you. Um, we, we find that for super critical machines, um, a, a wireless sensor is, 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 the, right, is the right tool. Um, we find for some of your critical and semi-critical, more, more often than not, a wireless sensor works fine. Um, and there is where you can start to understand too that ROI difference of generally a wired sensor is a lot more expensive. It's tethered in and it, it has a lot more, um, a, a lot more um, complexity that's there inside the, inside the hardware and therefore more expensive, whereas a, a wireless sensor um, could easily serve your semi-critical or critical assets and, and get you the data that you need. Uh, the next question, what infrastructure needs to be in place in my facility for this machine to operate? Again, we see this more in line with the wired and wireless sensors, um, but it's important to ask yourself, do you need a network connection? Do you have to have, if you don't have a network connection, um, do you have uh, ethernet capability throughout your facility if it's a wired sensor? Um, how are you going to tether in to particular machines if they're super critical? Are they in an area where you can do that? Or will you need to have uh, someone come in and, and add that infrastructure for you? Now, sometimes that's absolutely justified. And sometimes you may wanna say, uh, this may be better, These machine, this particular machine, it might be better for a handheld tool. So you really have to ask yourself uh, questions like that. And then where does my data need to integrate uh, in, in, with, with our system? Uh, if you've got an outside system, if you have a CMMS, if you have an asset management system, this is kind of what Leah was talking about at the very beginning of saying, hey, um, where do I need the, my data to go? Where is it gonna be most effective to me? Because sometimes, where the software, where it, the data lands, the first step isn't where, where it needs to be, right? You need to get it into your system. That's an important thing to understand because if, if you go halfway, you're gonna spend the rest of your program wishing you had gone the rest of the half, you know, the rest of the way. Uh, and in, in also understanding what needs to be triggered uh, based upon that data. Do I need a work order? triggered if there's an alarm? Do I need to be able to tell uh, one of my technicians? How is that going to, to work and how's it going to flow? All those questions definitely think about. And, and then the last question that we have here, um, which machines warrant the cost of an in individual sensor? Uh, and then can those sensors or machines be monitored with handheld tools when uh, a technician's time could be spent elsewhere? Um, we all know how, how busy it can be on the floor. 
So asking yourself, does, do I need a sensor? Do I need a handheld tool? Do I have the time to have someone go by? Um, there are machines that definitely, <laughs> you know, when you look at the cost of a sensor, you could say, you know, that machine, if it goes down, that just means, you know, that I'm in my office and convenience store that, you know, that, that we have extra spare parts, we have extra of this, we can switch over to the secondary machine and, and get it replaced out in time. Perhaps those machines are the best to have with, um, with handheld tools. Whereas with the sensors, you really want to focus in and say, okay, the, the cost of this machine going down means much more than the cost of the sensors and therefore I'm willing to go with that. Uh, and then the, the last point that I have here, or that we have here is you're not looking for the tool that will give you the most amount of data, you're looking for the tool that will give you the right data. Um, and I know I made that joke just a few minutes ago about lots of data, but is it the most, is it giving you what you need to determine the faults and, and, and determine what's next for you to, to do, uh, especially when you start getting up into the, the, the machines and the tools that are supposed to be giving you um, really analytical information so that you can take your next steps, you have to ask that question, am I just getting a lot of data? Because I think we've all heard the term garbage in, garbage out. If you're getting lots of data that doesn't mean anything or doesn't get you to where you're going, you need to stop and say, what tools do I have that will get me what I need? John, next slide. Okay, great. Thanks, Samantha. So let me uh, kind of uh, continue on and, and wrap up um, uh, with uh, what Samantha had did a, did a great job of explaining. Um, and uh, thanks again for that, Samantha. So when you're when you're trying to, when you're considering which tool you you want and and how do you address the problems that we've kind of talked about you know what is the biggest problem and the problem is uh, you know time and resources you know so w over the past 30 years um, I've been working with a lot of companies and uh, what happens very often is when teams look at all the machines in their plant. Um, and they start looking at their resources, they start at the top and they work their way down. And so they start with those production critical machines, the top 10%. The top um, and they kind of ignore the bottom 30% because they're not important. Uh, so if you think about it, the reliability team and the operations team and the machine experts are focusing on those top 10%, which, which do need to be heard. The problem is the middle 60% is being ignored and that's where our problem is. That, that middle 60% is what the maintenance teams, and you know that's, what, that's who I'm working with quite often, is the maintenance teams that are saying, we're just not, we don't have the tools, we don't have the resources, we don't have the, uh, the ability to do those, those, those middle machines. So how do we do that? Well, the answer is, you know, to to look at a tiered approach, kind of like what the medical industry does. So uh, I'm trying to get my slide to advance here. So sorry about that. But if you think about it, the medical industry has the same issue. They have millions of patients and not enough specialists. So how do they do that? Well, you need to do that by first screening out using simple tools to find out is the machine good or bad you know and the second thing is after you find out which machines are good or bad so we're screening out the 80 percent we don't want to analyze a healthy machine when you look at the next step just like a doctor looking for the most common problems with rotating machinery that's imbalance misalignment bearings and looseness so again let's look at those most common problems first before we call in the experts to look at the more complex problems. And so that's a way of kind of relating what Samantha was talking about. Again, the answer is it depends. It depends on your plant, it depends on your applications, it, apply, it depends on your needs, but there are tools that allow us to be able to screen, diagnose, and analyze all the machines in the plant 
using portable and remote wireless and wired uh, types of, of uh, tools. Okay, I think that kind of wraps us up and let's, let me turn this over back to Samantha and, uh, and uh, Leah uh, and see if you have any questions. Thank you, John. So audience, I'm going to actually switch it up right here. Right now, you see their email addresses on screen. We will be sending you this slide deck afterwards. You will have their email addresses. You are welcome to follow up afterward. Right now, I would love it, John, if you would forward to the next slide because we have several questions in the audience about things that I think are more specifically on this next slide, um, questions about software, questions about batteries, um, questions about data integration with proof technic tools. So can you talk a little bit about the um, 3563 sensor? Um, this page here, audience, you will again, you will get this slide with this link. There is a page, a landing page here with data sheets and more information about it. But I think if we use the next four minutes or so to talk about, again, batteries um, and software options and integration, that would be time well spent. Yeah, so we can get started. I'll let Samantha do that. Okay, uh, especially with the, the software question. Um, so Fluke Reliability has created a, 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 a new web app. It is for our, our new sensors. We're actually um, planning a full line of, of sensors and then also an area where we can integrate our other tool data, both from the Proof Technic side and from the Fluke Connect side, into a, a single platform. And that is called Live Asset Portal. Um, the first products that are, are going to be available with Live Asset Portal is our 3563. Uh, and a user would have the ability to look at all of their assets, to look at specific uh, assets and, and the data that's coming from their sensors or from their different tools, uh, as, as well as um, really kind of look across their facility for asset, total asset health. I think that's a, a, a quick description that'll give us within the four minutes. Um, in, in terms of uh, kind of some information about that, that sensor, Leah, batteries were a question. Mm -hmm. um, this, this sensor does have batteries. Uh, it, it is, a, you know, it, it could have been an additional question on that, on that list that I, I mentioned uh, just a few slides ago of, you know, do you have the, the, the time and the capability to, to replace batteries and, and to, to do that? Um, it, it's a big question. So this batter, this sensor has six batteries. It has a, a year long battery life one set at the defaults. So we have certain um, measurement defaults that uh, we, we take measurements for and then we send measurements uh, with. Uh, and then if, if someone wants to go and um, change those change those defaults they can and it will just affect the battery so in a lot of situations in most situations um, our defaults are, are very low and by um, elongating that um, that that time between your intervals and taking measurements you're able to actually elongate your battery so you can take something that a, a sensor that did have a one-year battery life and turn it into two two and a half three years um, and you do advocate, so, you, so this particular sensor you have on the screen here does allow for replacing the batteries, right? Yes, yeah, this is a, a replaceable battery. I, I know in, in the past we had the, the 3561 uh, that is, is a current product right now. It's a screening sensor, so this sensor is a, it's different than the other one. This is, um, the 3563 is an analysis sensor, so it gives you um, high resolution data. Uh, the other sensor uh, is one that is a screening tool. There's a three-year battery life, and it's kind of one and done. So once once the battery is done, you, you chuck it in your recyclable bin, and then you move on to the next one. This one, however, does have the capability of, of lasting a lot longer because you can replace your batteries. And you mentioned that uh, there's more in the works around this entire portfolio. Should we stay tuned for more battery news? Oh, absolutely. We have some fun and exciting things coming out with um, sensors that um, really kind of use power in unique ways. Uh, mm -hmm. Power that is kind of already in a, in a facility. Uh, and, and that's really exciting. 
Okay, we will stay tuned for more updates. At this point, I have to have you forward on, but audience, you have, all, as always, have been fantastic with your questions, and we will be following up with those because I know there's more questions than we have had time to answer. Right now, I want to get everyone aware of our next webinar. It's on a very pertinent topic, given that we just had the major cyber hack at the pipeline. We have two experts who are going to be on deck, Matthew Houdon and Frederick Bodarm. We're going to be talking about managing cybersecurity risk in maintenance and reliability. And again, specifically to what do maintenance and reliability teams need to be aware of and what should they do? So this is not on the IT side. They'll talk about working with IT, but it's as maintenance and reliability, what are your risks? And what can you do to reduce that level of risk? So I hope that you will all join us for that webinar, super pertinent for today's times. And then if you'll forward one more slide for me, John. This is a reminder that when I close the presentation today, there will be a slight pause and then that survey will pop up and we would love it if you could stay on long enough to answer those survey questions for us. That will trigger then sending you a copy of the slides, as well as a certificate if you would like to get that. You can find the recording of this webinar at excelix.com as well as recordings of all the previous webinars and information about the webinars coming up. And that is all for today. So I wanna to say a huge thanks to both John and Samantha for all of the learnings you passed on today and to our audience. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Thank you everyone.